was about six years old or so, and my favorite hero, favorite newest hero of the day was Superman. And we lived out in the country, as I shared with you before, out in the, the holler, on Holler Road, out in southwestern Ohio. And we had this little barn in the back of the house, as we call it the shed, but it was, it was a barn, and it had that metal corrugated roof on top of it type of thing, and it had a pretty sharp peak on it. And I decided I wanted to fly. So I got up on that, that roof, and I worked my way up backwards, shimmed my way up to the top of that barn, and I turned around, laid on my belly, and I let her go. Well, a few seconds later, after a couple of flips and landing hard on my back and knocking the wind right out of myself and looking down and my shirt was torn from all those little nails, you know, and the blood, you know, little scratches on my belly and couldn't breathe and thought I was dead, but then I wasn't. And I said to myself, well, I'm never going to fly. I'm never going to fly. Well, fast forward about five, six years and it's a hot night, 1969. I'm, I'm dating myself here in July. And we're sitting there in a the room watching this grainy black and white image of Neil Armstrong stepping on the moon for the first time. And I sat there and I said, I proclaim to my whole family, I'm going to be an astronaut. And Dad says, well, that's great, son, but you're going to have to do a little better in school. you got to know math and physics and biology. I sat there a minute, shook my head, and said, I'm never going to be an astronaut. <laughs> never going to be an astronaut. And throughout my life, I found out there was lots of things that I was never going to be able to do. You know, I'm thinking, I'm going to be this. I'm going to, I'm going to play in the NFL. Well, I'm never going to play in the NFL. I'm going to be this. Well, I'm never going to do that now. But one thing I found out that I can do and nobody can say I can't do, is love. It, uh, you don't have to climb on a roof and try to fly off of it. You don't have to try to get on a rocket and fly to the moon. Love is something that we all can do. And we think about that. You know, that's, that's a relief to me. Because, you know, sometimes it's hard to love people. You ever notice that? There's sometimes there's just people it's just daggone hard to, to love. And yet, we have the freedom to love everybody. And we can do it anytime we want to. And we can do it any way we want to. And we can do it freely. And there's no hoops to jump through because it's our choice. It's not somebody else's choice. It doesn't matter if they want to be loved or not. I can still love them anyway. In fact, if they don't want me to, I'm going to love them more. It's just the way the kind of guy I am. Don't tell me not to do something. I'm going to do it anyway. So don't tell me you don't want my love. I'm going to love you. But this whole month, we talked about this idea of love and how Christ is the answer to the needs of this world. And we looked at 1 John, and we haven't looked at every verse in 1 John, but we're going to close our, our message on John in chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. 1 John 7, 4, 7 through 21. Let's stand together for the reading of God's Word. <clears throat> Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed His love among us, he sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. We know that we live in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in Him and He in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in Him. 
In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world, we are like him. There is no fear in love. The perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. You may be seated. <clears throat> you see, we, we find out that love is, is something that, that really is kind of foreign to us as human beings. We're created for relationship. We're created to have a relationship with one another and with God, but because of sin, that relationship is broken. And really, people in their own device is going to be most concerned about who? Themselves. And selfishness since tends to be the essence of being in the sinful nature. But God sent his Son to be love for us. These first, first couple of verses tell us, this, actually the first verse, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. God is our source of love. He is the one who loved us so much. He is the one who, who shares his love with us. We talked about the last few weeks about how the, uh, that, that Paul talks about that we have this faith in, in, in earthen vessels and how it's okay for us to be cracked pots. Because when he pours his love in us, it should flow out of us in every way possible. So I've got lots of cracks in my pot. I mean, I'm a cracked pot. And I'm, I'm glad because his love flows and comes out. He is the source of love. I cannot love in my own way. My love will be selfish. This is why we have many different words, Greek words for love in the Bible. In Greek language, there are seven different words for love. But only two of them are related to the kind of love God gives. One of them is, is brotherly love that can only come from loving others. And agape love, which is the, God, the love of God that's unconditional, that he pours into us, that can flow out of us as we love one another. He is a source of this love. But one thing about God's love, you know, we, we, we talk about in our society that, you know, love is great. And, and we, if we love people, you don't, you don't, you just let them do whatever they want. I mean, if you really love somebody, you're just going to accept them the way they are. And that's the way the world wants us to think. And that's the way the world wants us to behave. Because, you know, really, if you love me, you'll just let, you just, you just won't pick on me. You won't tell me I'm wrong. You won't tell me that, 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 that the stuff's going on, that type of thing. And, and the fact is, when you're a parent and you have a child... And you see your child doing something that's going to hurt them, hurt themselves. Like if, 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 my child, if my child was playing out in the street and I look out the window and she's out in the middle of the street, I'm going to scream my head off and tell her to get out of the street and go out there and grab her and pull her. And she's going to cry and she's going to be, oh, that hurt, that hurt, that hurt. Yes, because I love you and don't want you to get smashed by a truck. Love requires action. It requires action. These next few verses tell us about this action. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. If we do not love others, then the love of God is not in us. There has to be action with this love. This is how God showed his love among us. God's love had to show action for us. So he sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Now that's God's love. God's love flowed out of him so much. He loved his creation so much. He saw us in our need. And he saw us in our sinfulness. And he saw us in our want and our, our hurting. And he saw us in our pain and suffering and the deep sorrow that we have in our hearts and the, the lostness that we feel and the helplessness that we feel and, the, and the, the need that we have to know that somebody cares. He saw all of that and he gave his love to us through Jesus Christ. So love requires action. God is a source of love. 
And when he gives that love, it cannot just be stagnant inside of us. I think I asked this question before, but what happens to, you know, those big rain barrels at the end of the gutters, you know, those, you know, you got your gutters and your downspouts, those old rain barrels we used to have when I was a kid, you know, water gets in there. What, what happens if you don't use that water? It gets stagnant. It gets stale. It, it, it gets this green stuff and bugs are squimming all over it. It just, it loses any value whatsoever if it's not used. And when God gives us love, it has to be used. It has to be flowing out of us so that God himself could give us more love. See, we can never outlove God. So I can't love too many people and run out of love. It doesn't work that way. And so God is our source, and this love requires action. But this love is required in action through relationship. These next few verses tell us this. This is love, that not that we love God, but He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. A relationship. Christ, God loved us so much, He sent His Son to be one of us to build a relationship with us that He knew every pain, every sorrow, He knew every temptation, everything about being a human being. God sent His Son to do this so that when He died for our sins, we can know that there is one person who has lived on this earth who understands and has a, is able to do something to give us life. And so it was in relationship. So in verse 11, he says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. If we love one another, if we're in relationship with him and with each other, if we love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourself, love our brothers and sisters, understanding that those who hate us need our love probably more than those that we know that love us. When we understand this and let that love flow out of us, we are living in a relationship with God that is just, it just is constantly flowing. Constantly flowing. He's never going to let us dry up. I mean, you know, I, I lived down in the country and we had a well that occasionally, you know, if it didn't rain for a long time, got dry. And we had to go into town and Dad, we had this big old tank and we filled it up with water and had to pull it out to the house type of stuff. It ran dry. God's well of love never runs dry. And as long as we give it away, it's fresh. And it flows out of us. It is relational. This love is relational. The best part about this love is it brings us freedom. There's a freedom that comes from being able to love just for love's sake. You see, if we have the idea that God only loves us when we're good. I've had many people tell me that when I was a kid. Well-meaning folks. But you know, I'd act up, and I act up quite a bit. I was in trouble all the time. And it'd be, some of them would say, you know, God doesn't love you when you act that way. And that's not true. That's not true. God understands but he also wants us to change. He wants us to behave, but he loves us no matter what we do, or he would not have died on the cross for our behavior and our lostness and our hurt and our pain. So this freedom comes from knowing that we live in him and he in, in us because he has given us of his spirit. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of, of Jesus Christ. Paul calls the Holy Spirit many of things, including God, the Spirit of God, and, and the, the Spirit of Jesus that dwells within us. The three in one, God is God, and God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all one, and they dwell with us and in us through His love and His love for us. But again, this freedom gives us the capacity to truly testify, to truly live, to truly understand what life is all about. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. We have seen and testify. How do we see that God has sent His Son into the world? 
when we see what God has done in our own lives, how he has changed us, how he took me from being a, 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 a no good boy with nothing to offer anybody, always in trouble, always in the, doing the things I'm not supposed to do, always going to church but never understanding and knowing who Jesus Christ is, living my whole life as if I'm the only one that matters. You know, just let me play football, let me have my pizza, and, and you know, I like the girls too. Type of living that I had until I got married at 19 and at 20 years of age found Jesus Christ and he showed me what real love was. He showed me what real love was. It isn't selfish. He changed me deep inside and helped me see that there's something more to life than just my broken way of seeing things. And so I can see what he has done. And if we see what he has done, we must testify about it. And the love of God gives us that freedom because if we truly love others, whether they love us back or not, we want them to know what salvation is all about. That there is hope in this world. That there is a possibility that what you see each day in your life that looks so awful and so dreadful and you can hardly get out of bed and you don't want to go to work and you don't want to, you don't, you don't want to talk to your, anybody, you, 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 don't want to, you, don't, you just can't stand it. You turn on the TV and all you see is all this garbage on the news. You see all this stuff and the world just is awful. That is what so many people see each day. And we can show them something so much better than that. And if we love them, we want them to know the world is not all that there is. There's something so much greater, so much more wonderful than what we see around us. But again, it comes to that, that, that nasty word, acknowledge. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. Again, that word acknowledge in Scripture is not the kind of acknowledgement, you know, I acknowledge, it, I acknowledge that you exist. I don't care about you, but I acknowledge that you exist. You have your rights for your breath that you breathe. Not that kind of acknowledgement. It is a word to know. If anyone knows that Jesus is the Son of God, knows in their heart, in their soul, in their mind, knows without a doubt that, G that God is real, that Jesus Christ is truly the Son of God and dwells in my heart. Anybody who knows this without a doubt, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love of God for us. Why? Because he lives in us and God is love. This is our source. This is the freedom I don't have to be the one to, to try to, to manufacture this love. I don't have to be the one to, 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 to write down all the things that I have to do to show love. I don't have to have a, a spreadsheet of what it means to show love today between 8 and 5. God in me and God in you gives us the freedom to simply live our lives in love. In love. The best part about that is the freedom from judgment. In verse 17, it says, In this way love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Because in this world, we are like him. Now, a lot of times we get caught up in thinking, well, you know, I'll never, I'll never, I'll never be... You know, I'll never be perfect. Well, we won't. And I'll never be, I'll never be, you know, I, I, can, I can represent Christ, but I'll, I'll never be Jesus, and we won't. But the fact is, in this life, we can be like Jesus. Now, can I, can I feed us all with a loaf of bread? No. I wish I could. Can I heal people who are sick? No. Can I walk on water? No. Anybody here can walk on water? I want to see that. Do I, can I do anything that Jesus did that was a miracle? No, not unless he moves through me. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about 
the fact that God is love. And I can love just like Jesus loves. I can be just like him. In his perfect love for all people, he loved the leper that nobody would ever touch. He loved the woman at the well that all of society ostracized and pushed away and made her go in the heat of the day all by herself to the well because you don't belong with us. He reached out and touched her. He had the freedom to go against the norms of society who said, no, if you're crippled or if you're, if you're less than perfect, you, don't, you can't even come into the temple. You don't have any value. If you're a woman, you don't have any value. If you're, if you're a, a Samaritan, you don't have any value. If you're, if you're blind, you don't have any value. If you have anything, what's wrong, wrong with you, you don't have any value. And Jesus says, wrong. Everyone, every single person has value. And I love them all. And I have come to die, not just for you, but for the whole world. Warts and all. Warts and all. Verse 18 is kind of hard, though. There is no fear in love. And yet, loving people is not always an easy thing to do. See, love, love is something that requires a risk. God knew that when he created us the way we are with free will choice that his love could be rejected. And it is continually by billions every day. And the pain that God must feel for the lost who, who refuse to accept the love that he has for them. But he loves us so much it was necessary to give us this free will choice because love requires a choice. I can't make you love me. I can scare you into obeying me if I was a dictator. If I had a, if I had a gun right here and I could stand, stand here and, and, and demand that you give me your obedience, I could do that. But that is not love. So God gives us an opportunity to choose to love. And there's no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear. This perfect love is not a love that I can manufacture. I cannot manufacture a perfect love. I cannot manufacture a relationship in my own strength, in my own power, in my own goodness to be a perfect relationship. I can't do it. Because my love in my own capacity is going to have some selfishness within it. Like, what can I get out of this relationship? That's human nature, is it not? We make arrangements or we, we make deals and we, we make friendships through our lives. And, and if we don't have the love of God as the overwhelming source of why we do things, we're always thinking about the, you know, the reciprocal thing. You know, what, what can I get out of this relationship? You know, and, I, and I'll love you as long as you... Supply what I need. And if it ever gets to where that's not happening, we'll just part ways. We'll just part ways. And perfect love drives out fear, drives out selfishness, drives out everything that separates us from God and from one another. That's what perfect love does. Again, in our tradition, we call that entire sanctification. That's a, that's a term that, you know, seems so old and so, so whatever. It simply means living a life in wholeness in God. Living in the love of Jesus Christ in such a way that all the hate, all the, the desires to, for selfish needs and, and all the things inside of us that, that keep us from living this perfect love is just gone. Because we die to ourselves. We die to ourselves and we say, God, you know, I've made such a mess. Every time I've tried to do this on my own, every time I've tried to, to, to manipulate this or, or try to make sure I get this or try to make sure somebody behaves the way I think they should behave, it gets to be a mess. So God, just let me love with your love. 
and accept people the way they are, but God, pray for them and help them to see how much more you have for them to be than they are right now. Perfect love does not mean we have to accept or condone behavior of others. In fact, perfect love tells us that we love them so much that they know what they're doing is harmful for them if they're doing something that's wrong. Perfect love is not just simply saying, okay, I, I, I love so perfectly, I'm never going to worry about anything, and anybody can, you know, people can do whatever they want, and people can sit where do whatever. No. Perfect love says, I care more than I've ever cared before in my life. I care about you, and I care about your life, and I care about your future, and I care about your kids. I care about everything about you more than I ever have in my life because God himself loves you to the point of death. And if I have his love in my heart, that's how I understand my responsibility. And so we become like Jesus Christ with his perfect love in us, and it drives out the fear. Now, is there anxiety? Of course there is. Anxiety when you meet somebody new, or you talk to somebody you don't know, or somebody that's you got a problem with and you've had arguments with before, or whatever it is, when you confront an issue, there is anxiety, but there should be no fear because in love, in God's love, we are meeting the needs, the desires, the wonder of how God wants us to relate in the first place. He created us for relationship, to be filled with His Spirit, to be filled with His presence, to walk with Him in the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden. That's, how, that's what he, he created us to do. And through our sinfulness, we have broken that relationship, that sinfulness of, of desires, of, of doing my own thing, wanting to be God of our own lives, wanting to have control of our own destiny, wanting to be sure that I, I get what I want, that I'm in charge, and I'm in control, and I have control of this, and I'm, nobody can do this without my permission, and all this kind of stuff. All the things that are selfish and, and filled with desires for ourselves. The Holy Spirit comes and drowns all of that in love and washes it out and helps us to simply love Him and love others. And then He shows us what that looks like. He shows us what it looks like in our life. He shows us how to relate to one another. He shows us how to, He teaches us what it means to be true believers in a world that needs to know true believers, that needs desperately true believers. Folks, when you walk in the door, people know. You know, I, and I'm not certainly setting myself up as an example of this, but there are a lot of hurting people in this city. I mean, we lived here two months. I go into McDonald's and I have people asking me, are, are, you, are you the preacher? Well, thanks, Tom, for telling everybody. But are you the preacher? Yeah. Can I talk to you a minute? And they just, they, 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 there's needs all over the place, you know? And, and, and to love is all we're supposed to do. And wherever that love leads us in their lives, it's what it's all about. So the last two verses of this, well, actually verse 19, we love because he first loved us. This is the response. Why love God and why love others the way God calls us to? Because he first loved us. Because he first loved us. He didn't love us because we first loved him. He loved us when we were dead in our sins and our transgressions. We didn't have a care or a thought about God. He loved us when we didn't have any thought whatsoever about what I wanted. He loved us. When he died on the cross, he took all the sins and the decrees and all the stuff that's written against us, and he nailed it to the cross, as Paul tells us. And that is the love God has for us. And therefore, we should love the way he loves. But of course, we have to, if John, it's John, he has to give us a warning. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. I mean, that's the real word. That's, that's, I mean, that's, that's, this is the hard, hardest word in Greek that you can have for someone who just absolutely does not and cannot live the truth. Anyone who says, I love God, and yet hates someone else. If anyone who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. 
And he has given us this command. Whoever loves God, and he's moved now from ought in an earlier verse, must also love his brother. So what is our response to this beautiful love that God has given us? We can take it, and selfishly enjoy it, and be proud of it, and walk around so puffed up because we're filled of it, and we can just say, look at us, how great we are because of it, and I'm so full of God's love, I can't possibly deal with somebody like you. Or we can understand that his love was meant to be spent, to be used, to flow out of us, to love everybody, no matter who they are. And as we look at the news and we see what's going on in the Middle East, that includes loving those who have a machete and want to cut off our heads. Of praying for their salvation. Of wanting them to know Jesus Christ. Jesus, there at the cross, taking the nails in his hands. And one of his first words is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And this is the love God has for us and the love we should have for one another. So maybe there's people in your own lives, maybe there's people in this own church that you struggle with, that you just don't like. Maybe in your own family, there's people you just prefer not, prefer not to see, prefer not to talk to. I've got those people. And I had to deal with it. I had to deal with, with how do I relate to someone like that. And I had to die to myself. I have to say, Lord, let your love rule supreme in my heart. God calls us to this love, not with banging cymbals and clanging drums and banging and clanging and screaming and hollering. God calls us to this love by a small, still voice. Small, still voice. And he's calling us today. He's saying to us, as he said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And John's answer was, or Peter's answer was yes. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. And who are God's lambs but everybody? He wants every person to be part of his flock. He wants every human being that's ever been born to be part of the flock of Jesus Christ. To know salvation. We're going to sing today softly and tenderly just a couple of verses. And I pray that if the Lord is speaking to you about someone in your life that you need to deal with. God is speaking to you about the way you react to other people. God is speaking to any of us about His love and the need for it to flow out of us a little bit more. I pray that you'll listen to Him. The altars are always open if you'd like to come and pray, but God speaks to us wherever we are. To be honest with you, sometimes when it comes to dealing with other people, it takes a little time. It takes a little time. So let God continue to speak with you these days and weeks ahead. There's nothing more I want than for us as a family of God to be so in love with Him and with each other that the world cannot help but see that this is a place where God's presence is found. That's my prayer. That's my desire.